the, the thing actually started. Live streaming is on. Hey everybody, welcome to the August 2021 meeting of the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. Uh, unfortunately tonight we're mostly back in our own homes due to a, a technical glitch with the internet over at HRP. Uh, we've managed to, to run a limited operation there just for a, a couple of select people that uh, are hiding from the camera right now. Um, and John, who is, is very much hiding from the camera behind uh, his uh, very uh, socially conscious mask. Um, uh, but we will turn it over to, to John real quick to, to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, John. Hey, this is uh, Bruce Moore. I met him when I was on my way out to the uh, West Texas Star Party, which is a substitute for the Texas Star Party. I met him uh, in a motel I stayed in in Abilene. I believe it was Abilene. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we got to talking there a little bit about astronomy and I found out that he was involved in the part of the fabrication of the mirror that was used for the SDSS survey. So I'd ask him to speak. And so here he is to speak to us and tell us about the fabrication of the mirror. Hey guys, y'all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Bruce Moore. I'm a mechanical engineer. I am actually got interested in how mechanical engineering interfaces with glass and that's a field called optomechanical engineering and that kind of got me introduced to a lot of neat people and um i got to do some cool work and one of the very first projects i worked on is what i'm going to talk to you about tonight um this is the sloan digital sky survey i think there's two of these i think this particular mirror I worked on went to Chile and I swiped uh, some text out of a, a paper I found on, on on the internet and the the link to that's down below if you ever want it. Basically it's a two and a half meter F 2.25 primary and the central hole in the primary mirror is 1.17 meters and that's kind of an interesting number and we'll run across that a little bit later. Um, my involvement uh, started with the initial casting, um, I got invited out to Hextech to see this thing after they had cast it. Um, they cast the, the primary mirror and it cooled with a crack in it and they remelted it. And you could still see the crack after they remelted it, but I guess everybody was okay with it. But I remember seeing it thinking, you know, I don't think I'd buy a windshield that looked like this, but I guess it's okay for the mirror. Um, I, I was a little bit involved with generating the casting. So that's taking the coarse uh, mirror blank and just, you know, using a high speed grinder to bust off a lot of the glass. So you don't have to spend a lot of time polishing it. And there's an interesting story that happened there. Um, I built the handling fixtures for polishing this mirror. And actually, quite a lot of went into that. Um, there's a null lens to measure the progress of the, the mirror figuring process. And there was a design defect in the null lens that I got to fix, which is kind of fun. I don't have much about that in here. Um, the Strasbaugh polishing system, I don't know if you're familiar with Tras Strasbaugh, but they've built a lot of big mirror polishing uh, tables. And, um, and I got to watch a lot of the measurements being taken with, with the null lens. While it, while it was being built. And uh, then it got finished, shipped off to get coated, transported to Chile and First Light and all that. But I stayed here in the United States. Um, the, the SDSS mirror is about the size of this one, 100 inches. So when I look at it compared to everything else, I just, <laughs> I just kind of lose a little bit of enthusiasm because all this stuff is huge. But, but, for me at the time, this was a, a giant mirror. Anyway, I talk about the mirror casting now. Uh, the The mirror casting was done at Hextech. It's a local Tucson company, and their thing is providing lightweight mirror and metrology needs. And, and especially, they have these hexagonal lightweight pockets in there. So there's one about a foot across, you know, just for show. And here's a computer model of one with all the hexagonal pockets in it. And that's kind of cool stuff. Um, on their web page, if you go there, um, you'll see the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 
is listed as one of their customers. So you can follow up on me and make sure I'm not blowing smoke. Um, so on their website, they advertise their process as gas fusion fabrication. So if you can imagine, they take a face plate and a back plate, two sheets of glass, borosilicate glass, high purity stuff. And then they <clears throat> put a bunch of tubes between the two sheets. And somehow they have a process by which they both pressurize the tubes so that they expand. And they also heat all the glass so it fuses together. So you end up with uh, roughly kind of like a beehive pattern in there of all these hexagons um, um, kind of bonding the face plate and the back plate together. And uh, that's kind of cool. I thought, I don't know how they do it. I'm, and I'm sure that's why they're in business because they can do it. Um, here's just, uh, <clears throat> this again is from their website. Um, they've got their face and back plates, you know, various thicknesses. And these hexagons kind of form after expanding the tubes under pressure while it's hot. And if you have any questions, just stop me. I don't mind being interrupted. And uh, here's a close up of that one from the front of the website. So you can see how these tubes are kind of blown up into hexagons, but they have a little bit of an irregular shape to them. So I was looking at this, I was actually looking at this just a couple nights ago, and I saw a picture of the finished, almost finished um, uh, digital sky survey telescope. And this is the surface after it's been figured and polished, but before it's had the aluminum coating put on it for reflectivity. And these hexagons look extremely regular. And I was thinking to myself, how can they be so regular? Because uh, that's just doesn't look like the kind of process they're advertising on their website. And um, so I'm going to jump to one slide here. What I found in that paper was the mirror was cast by Hextech, but the casting technique was similar to that developed at the University of Arizona Mirror Lab, except that the furnace is not rotated. So this is what is done at the Mirror Lab. This isn't the digital sky survey mirror, but this is how they work. They get this giant mold and they fill it full of glass. And these are chunks of glass about the size of your fist. They just come in tons and tons of box from boxes from Japan or uh, what's that place called? I can't remember now. Cor Corning. Yeah. And if you look up close, this is what they're doing. They're hand placing these chunks of glass on top of the surface. And you notice this has hexagons in it. In it. So what this is, is each hexagon is actually a tower of the thickness of the mirror. And this glass is all going to melt and it's going to run down between all these hexagons. So now each of these hexagons will form a hexagonal cavity that becomes um, the internal structure of the mirror. And the, the base of these hexagons are secured with like, I think it's about a two inch post to the bottom of the mold. So the back side of the mirror, when it's all cooled and the molding is removed, you'll see these holes that open up into these hexagonal cavities and they put enough glass to cover this whole thing so when the, when the glass is cooled and the molding is removed, you have a solid face sheet, you have a bunch of hexagonal internal cavities, and then the back of the mirror has a bunch of holes. And uh, so that explains how you get this super regular hexagonal pattern. And it, it was just interesting to me that um, in spite of what they advertise on the website, um, this mirror was not done by the gas fusion process. It was done by that. And Interestingly, this white material, it's, it's, it's very light and it's kind of brittle and flaky. So after the mirror cools, the way you get rid of this material is you get a high pressure um, nozzle, like a sprayer, and you just start spraying in those holes and this stuff starts disintegrating and just kind of washes out. And what's left behind then Looking again through the through the face sheet, um, you can see the reason these are still white is because that's the surface roughness. That's basically you've molded the surface finish of the hexagonal posts into the glass, and there's no point in reaching in there and polishing it. So it's just kind of rough, and that's how it looks. 
but but I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, there's that. Let's see, what does this say? Okay, and this was kind of interesting in this paper from Princeton. They said the first casting attempt failed during annealing and cracks were found in the blank when the oven was open. The cause of the failure were identified and corrected. The mirror was reheated in January. After a successful anneal, the blank was cleaned and inspected and found to be of excellent quality with low residual stresses. So I never saw the failed condition. What I saw was after the last anneal, and it still had the, a hairline crack in it. But I guess people who know more than me knew that it was still okay. Or maybe people managing the schedule and writing the checks said, I don't care, it's okay anyway. That would be a management decision, not a not an optical one. Okay, this now I'm gonna talk about generating the blank. So when this thing came out as a solid casting, it was flat all the way across the top. Uh, the curvature here is exaggerated, but it's just to make it easier to point to pictures. So rather than trying to start in the middle and just slowly, painstakingly polish a curve into the whole mirror, what you do is you get a grinder and you set it up on a gantry and you just have it grind a cone in the mirror. And uh, uh, here's a picture that kind of shows that process. And here's a sketch of kind of how I think it looked the way it was described to me, the whole mirror sitting on a table, a turntable, and then this grinder. I don't know how sophisticated the grinding wheel was, but it would just kind of follow this trajectory to generate a cone into the into the glass. Um, so there's some basic math associated with this. And it, it kind of goes like this. L is a service loop. That's how much slack is in this cord. And T is the tool travel, although strictly speaking, I guess the tool travel should be kind of like that. But the basic math is you want the service loop to be greater than the tool travel, because if the service loop is less than the tool travel, bad things happen. And the other thing is you want the number of people watching this whole process to be one or more. And if there's less than one person watching, that's not so good. And I'm only bringing it up because as this thing was being generated, it turned out that the service loop was less than the tool travel and the number of people paying attention was actually less than one. And so what happened was as the motor was traversing this way and grinding away glass into a conical shape, before it got to the inside diameter, it unplugged itself from the wall, which meant that this wheel was no longer cutting glass. It was just kind of rolling along the top of the glass, putting tremendous force right here. And the effect of that was it actually put a crack in the face plate right here. And then the mirror turned and, and propagated that crack in a complete circle all the way around the inside of the mirror. And this is kind of catastrophic. I would not want to be the guy that had to make that phone call. So the decision was made that in addition to grinding the outside handling surfaces, they would also grind away all of the inner diameter um, that could potentially be compromised by the existence of this crack. And that's actually very visible. Um, most people don't notice it because you're not looking for it. But this is the mirror, and uh, this is after it's been uh, uh, coated. You can see it's shiny. And these are the broken out hexagonal pockets. And they're broken out because instead of you know terminating at a, at a clean wall, they ground out the whole inner diameter of this thing to remove all the fractured or compromised material. Um, here's, here's another mirror that had troubles of a different sort, but you can see just for comparison, it has a solid inner wall. So this mirror was supposed to look like that on the inside and it, and it didn't. And there was quite a lot of drama associated with that event, as you can imagine. All right. So 
remember, I'm, I'm not necessarily an optical guy, I'm a, I'm a mechanical guy. So when it comes to supporting the mirror, um, here's another statement out of that Princeton talk. Um, it says the primary mirror is supported on air pistons using elastomeric low friction rolling seals for both axial and transfer supports. Three stiff load cells serve as axial hard points. Uh, simple servo systems act to control the pressure to, provided to those air pistons in the 120 degree sector associated with each load cell. Um, so the, this is basically just a load distribution system. And uh, the way these work, and forgive me if you already know all this, uh, basically the, the vernacular is this is called a whiffle tree. So this is pretty simple. Um, there's three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 pads. And each group of pads is on a triangle. And each triangle, each pair of triangles is on a beam. And each beam is connected to the center of yet another triangle. So you can imagine this, the, whatever mirror this is supporting is basically being held up in three points, but these uh, whiffle trees are spreading those points around. But because it all convolves down to these three axes here, here, and here, that it's a stable configuration. So you're distributing the load, but you're not gonna wobble. Um, here's another version of that. This has 54 points of contact. But it's still just three points when it comes to how it's mounted to the structure. So it's going to distribute the load and it's not going to wobble, which is good. Now, if you remember what I read earlier, it was supported by little pneumatic devices. So we tried to support this mirror with something similar. So I didn't do the work, but somebody else worked this all out. Um, this is a, these are just images from another mirror. But these are hydraulic pistons, and they're arranged so as to distribute the loads on the mirror and not let it wobble. So a word that comes up a lot in, kinem in uh, optomechanics is kinematic support, and that means it's supported without any redundancy. So I don't quite know how this arrangement works to provide a non-redundant support. But all this stuff can be modeled on the computer. Uh, a mirror like this with uh, equally loaded pistons arranged like that. I guess that works out pretty good, and that's what they use. And on our mirror, we did that too. I didn't have any pictures of that. It would have been fun to show you. Um, each of those pistons kind of looks like this. Um, there's nothing particularly special about it, except that it's you know, got a pointy shape to interface to the back of the mirror. Um, and normally pistons have an O-ring right around here, but for this application, you don't want to use O-rings because, because they tend to stick before they move a little bit. So it's got what they call a rolling membrane or a rolling seal. So this side can go up and down and this side doesn't move, but you maintain your constant pressure and there's no friction in trying to get this thing to move. So I thought that was kind of cool. And here's an example of all the lines connecting things like this together. And ours had many more pistons than this. Um, they were a lot lower profile and the lines were a lot smaller. But you can just sort of get a flavor for how many lines are running all over the place to connect these pistons together. All right. Now, the whole point of this whiffle tree stuff is to spread out the loads on the mirror. But there's another kind of load distribution that happens because of the way the mirror itself is built. And, and that is this. Um, if this is the front face of the mirror and this is the back face of the mirror, and these are all the hexagonal ribs, um, a lot of the front face is supported by hexagonal ribs. It's sitting on top of these walls. But most of the front face is not sitting on top of a wall. It's a... It's, uh, it's uh, supported by, by nothing, basically. It's just a stiffness of the glass. So what can happen is as the polishing tool is passing over the mirror, it'll actually depress the glass slightly over these empty pockets. And then when the weight of the tool is removed, that glass rebounds and leaves a bump. And that called, that's what's called quilting or print through. And on our mirror, this, it's kind of like this. So here's the, uh, the tool, 
polishing moving back and forth and spinning and while the mirror is turning and the tool pressure has weight and it deforms the glass between the ribs so the way we offset that is by pressurizing the inside of the mirror and it's pretty easy to calculate the pressure because you just take the weight of the tool divided by the area of the tool and that's how much pressure is applied to the mirror so you put that much air pressure inside the mirror and you basically uh, counterbalance the tool pressure. That's pretty clever. Um, here's uh, one of the polishing tools for this mirror being prepared. It's upside down. So you're seeing the polishing surface uh, face up right now. And uh, it would just go back and forth and back and forth while the mirror rotated underneath it. And it, it wasn't powered. It didn't like spin or anything like that. It would just kind of float across. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, I guess it's just pure experience and intuition and learning that goes into understanding how to set these up so that they'll do what you want them to do to the glass. Because these, these things will run for weeks and months, you know, and the, the master optician just knows how to tweak things so that it all turns out right. Anyway, so here's some more basic math, if you don't mind. So to offset the tool pressure, you need the mirror interior pressure to be equal to the tool weight divided by the tool area. That's pretty simple. To keep the mirror on the table, the maximum allowable mirror internal pressure is gonna be the mirror weight divided by the mirror area. So if, there, if the mirror internal pressure is the same as the mirror um, allowable pressure, then the mirror is no longer held by gravity, which is kind of okay. But if the mirror internal pressure exceeds the mirror um, maximum allowable pressure, then the mirror is actually going to float off the table until something stops it. And for this mirror, if I remember right, the mirror internal pressure to offset the tool was half a PSI. And the maximum allowable pressure was one PSI. So the margin of error was half a PSI minus two times the error in the pressure measurements. And uh, for me, this was just really befuddling because uh, I looked at all kinds of expensive pressure gauges and flow meters and, and, and control valves. And... Uh, I finally settled on something kind of ridiculously simple that worked really, really well. And that was this. Um, we set the mirror up here and it's sitting on its little red pistons. And I made our own homegrown um, inflatable, well, it's not an inflatable seal, but it's a rolling seal. So it's just sheet rubber bonded all the way around in an S shape to here so that the mirror could move up and down and the sheet rubber would not resist that. I had the same thing on the inside. And, um, and then, the, of course, this kind of kind of uh, leaked a lot. So I needed a lot of air to inflate this thing, but it needed to be very steady. And I needed to control the pressure with a lot of resolution. And I had to make darn sure I didn't blow the mirror off the table. So the solution was, at least that I came up with, was to get a, a residential gas meter because they use they control high rates of flow. And if you take this knob off the front, you see there's a, a, a long coil spring, a very lightweight coil spring, and it pressures on a big diaphragm, and that basically regulates the flow through the gas meter. So that regulated flow into here. Um, and then... To measure the pressure, I just used a manometer, a YouTube manometer, and that was really great because they're not expensive. Um, if you put some coloring in the water, you can read it, and the resolution is basically infinite. As long as you have a fine enough ruler, you can read what this thing says. And I used a second manometer, but I cut it off here at the maximum allowable pressure. And the purpose of that was if the pressure under the mirror got too high, it would just push the water right out of here. And then this would become a, re a relief valve. So if the pressure got too high, it would just start to blow out of here and then the mirror would settle back down on the pads. 
And that worked really well. I checked the pressure every single day and never had any problems with it, except once. One time I was doing something, I can't remember what, but I felt I needed to. Um, and you're on your, I like, I, I find that when I was doing the iPhone thing, of course, I always had AC stuff. Uh, okay. I'll keep going here. Um, I don't remember what I was doing, but I thought I needed to um, clamp off the safety manometer, which I did. And I adjusted the flow rate over here. And I watched the level here rise. And I suddenly realized, oh, my gosh, it's too high. Is, is that real? And I looked at the mirror. Sure enough, it was moving up. Now, on the bottom of the mirror, we had some uh, bonded plates that three of them attached, three rods attached to the bottom of the mirror. And then the other end of those three rods was attached to the table. And that was to prevent the mirror from uh, rotating or twisting. It took up the tangential forces and those things had lifted and those things were now holding the mirror on the table. They were never meant to do that, but that's what they're doing. So I quickly, carefully, um, slowly <laughs> restored the flow back to the safety manometer and the whole thing settled down. And I went and calmed myself down and realized how close I'd come to, you know, kind of destroying my career and the mirror. And I went back. So human error is a source of a lot of stress. There's probably a lot more stressful situations than there are real problems that happen. It's just, it's just very hard to be doing something for, for the first time and not screw up sometimes. But that all turned out okay. Um, so this is an actual picture. Um, I don't have the manometers on here. Uh, this is actually an attempt to use commercial equipment um, a low pressure gauge and an actual flow meter, but the manometers worked a whole lot better than that. Um, the the lead optician insisted that we have some sort of trough around the mirror so that the fluid and the slurry that uh, came off the mirror during the polishing process wouldn't dribble down the table and and make it rusty. So I thought, well, that's okay. So I basically just got some drainage pipe and we clamped it on there. Everybody was happy with that. That worked out all right. It was really ugly. Um, there was, I actually had a predecessor who had designed all this stuff before me, but it was all so expensive that they, they just couldn't do it. So I got to use my uh, backyard um, garage mechanic skills to do stuff on the cheap and that kind of worked okay. All right, so in addition to polishing the mirror, uh, there's this thing called a flipping fixture. And you basically got to be able to pick the mirror up and turn it over. And the reason is um, you want to grind and polish the blank on both sides because whenever you remove material from one side, you also remove lots of micro cracks and stressed material. So you kind of got to balance that, rebalance the stress distribution. And the way you do that is by flipping the mirror over and then grinding that side too. So this fixture was intended to do that. And I'm kind of proud of this fixture. Um, it was a long time ago, but I'm still kind of proud of it. Um, so it's, it's got what's called a kinematic design. And what that means is no matter how you hold the mirror, all you ever do is put, it in, put the glass into compression. And uh, I think I've got a slide about why that is. But basically, the design was there's three sliding joints all the way around and three ball joints here and uh, six turnbuckles that clamp a strap all the way around this thing. And the strap is rubber lined. So if you are the mirror, all you ever feel is the strap is squeezing you. And glass is really good in compression. It's not so great in uh, tension. Um, so this design was actually pretty good. And the chief astronomer, Buddy Martin, when he saw the design, he says, wow, that's perfect. So I was quite flattered by that. So the first step in putting this thing on was to get these huge steel rolled straps, which are lined with rubber, and um, use a crane to lower them around the mirror. 
and then close them on the mirror using a big strap because they're just too stiff to do by hand. And then once they're closed enough, you can put these turnbuckles on, which come from a Ford tractor, and then torque it all down and squeeze it together and then remove the safety strap. And this was just an unbelievably stressful process because I got all this metal floating around, hovering over this you know, mirror of this $8 million university project and nobody wants to help because nobody wants to be the one to break the mirror. Um, they were willing to take pictures, but not too willing to get much closer than that. And uh, this is me with a dark beard and they've got blocks of wood here holding up the steel straps and there's the, uh, the turnbuckles. And this was just <laughs> really, really stressful to be going through this. Um, nowadays, what I would do is I would build a, a uh, what do you call it, plywood, a plywood surrogate of the mirror, and I would practice this whole routine two or three times and take notes and tweak the plans and have five people watching, and we'd get together and review the notes and pictures and decide whether or not this is going to work. But back then, it was like, hey, Bruce, your parts are here. Go put them on. And that's what I did. Anyway, so that's the strap that held the mirror all by itself. Uh, the next part is the actual lifting fixture. And uh, these are those sliding sleeves and these plates are mounted on ball joints. And, um, and uh, this, this is the, these are the, yeah, these toggles go up to the overhead hoist and they lift the whole thing and down here is a worm gear that we found that we could use to rotate this whole thing and then here's the mirror over here waiting uh waiting for us to lift this up move it over and drop it down bolt on the plates and then pick up the mirror and the way those ball joints work were um those those large pins sorry i'll back up but if you can see them these are i think these are two inch steel pins and they pass through sleeves in the frame and they've got balls on the end and there's a ball joint here so this thing cannot uh put any twisting or pulling loads on the mirror all it can do is hold up the strap and then the strap is tight enough to clamp the mirror and like I said before, all the mirror knows is it's being squeezed. It doesn't see any other forces. So I'm going to ask you to try to put yourself in my shoes for a moment. Um, I haven't been out of school very long. Uh, this casting, I know, has a hairline flaw in it. Uh, I know the inner diameter of the mirror has been completely ground away due to a catastrophic manufacturing incident. I know the contract with U of A is worth millions of dollars. I know I've never done anything like this before. And all my management is upstairs waiting to get word on how it went, but nobody wants to hang around and watch. So I was uh, fairly, fairly uh, stressed out about doing this, but um, I was able to put it all together and lift up the mirror and it got off the floor and nothing cracked or broke which was great. And this is me uh, turning that wheel to start flipping the mirror and it's turning nice and smooth and nothing's cracking or breaking and that's great. And I uh, got it flipped all the way to the vertical position and uh, everything worked fine. It was, it was amazing. It was one of the best feelings in the world to pull this off. Um, so while it's in this position, it's easier to appreciate uh, kind of how clever it is that there's a there's a there's a shaft down here, but it's it's a sliding shaft, so it's not pushing the mirror up at all, and so the mirror is just hanging there, being pulled this way by gravity, and it's pulling in on these guys, but all they do is try to squeeze the strap a little tighter, but the strap's already been tightened by the turnbuckles. So really the mirror has no idea it's moving or anything. It's, it's, it's just, it just, it just worked out really good. I was really proud of it. Huh, yeah. So this, this guy, this is John Cropper. He's a chief um, optician. Uh, this is one of the grad students. And I think 
back there, that's uh, Marty Valente. He ran the optical shops down there. So I breathed a big sigh of relief and was glad to have that done. And it's kind of fun to be talking about it. So thanks for watching and listening. And uh, if you got any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah, the uh, the whew, I can imagine also being the uh, the guy that was upstairs and uh, just waiting for the the sound of that giant crash when you were trying to, to flip the mirror. And uh, I can yeah. understand why they would be in the other room. I'm not sure I'd want to watch that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But even worse to be the guy in the room that was fully responsible. Wow. Right. Right. And that's right about the, the same person that uh, left the room while the, the machine unplugged itself, I, I think. Mm. Um, so yeah. not quite a, a, a cursed project, but uh, definitely. Right. <laughs> if one bad thing goes wrong, you start looking for others. Well, the, the lead optician, um, John Crawford, he he was kind of a big, kind of slow-moving guy, which is what you'd expect you know, for an optical project like this. But he's also really morose. And he had this great big, it looked like a stealth vulture that he mounted on the polishing machine. And he, started, and he called it Sloan. He says, yeah, that's Sloan watching over the carcass. And I thought, geez, John, that's, a, that's not the that's I was hoping for, but he was funny yes. that way. Yeah, and it's a weird sense of humor for probably somebody that doesn't spend a lot of time with people, I would imagine. I'm not sure exactly the... the 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 social habits of a, a master optician but uh right. i always imagine them as, as being in a very quiet room off by themselves somewhere yeah okay. yeah mm -hmm. okay uh any questions for our, our guests this is a fantastic presentation thank you very much oh, you're very welcome now I have I do have one comment. As someone who deals with measuring low pressure gas a lot, your choice of water manometers was was a great choice. They are extremely accurate and very quick responsive. That was oh, a very that was a very good choice. Thank you very much. What um on that mirror? The, the coating that's on it, just a standard aluminized coating, or do they use any kind of a special coating? I think it was just aluminum. Okay. Yep. Uh, keeps from having to hire somebody to go polish it, I guess. I think. You don't <laughs> want it to tarnish. Which, 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 uh, with that large that's of a it. central hole, what was the effect of light gathering of that mirror? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I thought about this. And I tried to remember a conversation. Are you still seeing my screen, by the way? Yes. Oh, okay. your uh, no, not your screen, you. but uh, you, yeah, we can see that you've got your camera turned off and uh, you're, you're not broadcasting any uh, uh, okay. uh, PowerPoint. I, well, I, I can just talk through this. Um, so if you imagine the face plate of the mirror, um, there's typically a little dead area right at the edge, right? Where you're not polishing all the way to the edge. Right. But, but if I remember right, the contract specified a certain number of total square inches of light gathering. Oh, okay. So, so they pushed that outer diameter right to the limits in order to meet what they had signed up to do. So that I don't think they lost any light gathering ability. That's good. Yeah, well, I... I F2, God. That's amazing, <laughs> F2. <yeah. laughs> a, that's, that's about what the, uh, the, the, the hyperstars these days are doing, but, you know, on a much, much grander scale than uh, the, the, the local people. And uh, to take a, a one-meter telescope at F2, I'm not even sure what the – I guess the giant telescopes must also be pressing that, but that's, that's a very quick system, very drinking a lot of light very, very quickly. Oh, Your yeah. curvature diagrams were not exaggerated too much <laughs> to get the F2. That's unreal. Yeah. yeah. What amazed me one time is to see people walking on this thing. I mean, they took their shoes off. They're wearing their socks. They would stand on it, and I, I just I just cringed. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I'm dying. Well, that, 
that'd be a great little sign to 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 have put on the mirror is this is a no shoes facility yeah it's, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not walk. <laughs> but the, wow I, I would not have the nerve to do anything like that the uh the the close i i I think I tried to, to stand on a, a, a glass countertop stove to, to get to something higher one day and it ended up being a uh, breaking the glass on that. So yeah, oh, uh, memories of that would oh yeah. Do you like, know what the what the not context a very great, for that was? What were they why were they walking on it? Um they freeze tag. They I think they're eyeballing potential defects or scratches or something. Because as they as they got closer to the end of the figuring process, they would switch to finer and finer grits inside the col polish the compound. So every every time he switched to a finer grit, he had to wash the whole thing off and mm -hmm. and even yeah, I think even squeegee it sometimes. And if he had one speck from the previous polishing process on there, it would basically just kind of ruin everything you did. You have to polish it until you remove that entire series of scratches. And that's kind of like the uh, the advice on uh, uh, cleaning mirrors. Just regular old tiny, you know, standard amateur mirrors is always the final step. Is and if you dare, what you do is you run your hand over it once it's properly soaked and all that to feel for the tiny little grits. So I, I can yeah. imagine it might be something similar to that. Um, just yeah. you know, with your feet, and you don't want to get on your hands and knees, I, I suppose. Right. right. But uh, it's, uh, the the final thing that uh, yeah, nothing nothing quite beats the human touch. Uh, I, I suppose that's the, what it boils down to. But but mm -hmm. still, I, 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 I talk about the the things you make the graduate students do just to to mess with them. I, I think that would be a perfect example. Yeah. Um, Hey, I, I got a question for you guys, if you don't mind. Um, I heard you talking earlier. Somebody mentioned LIGO, interfacing with LIGO somehow. Yes. So I remember, I mean, I've kind of kept my eye on some things, you know, advanced physics and things like that at work. And I, I saw the story come out about LIGO and I was reading about the gravitational waves and what the source mm -hmm. was. And as my mind began to wrap around the magnitude of what it means for two black holes to spiral in on each other and mm -hmm. sort of ripples through the universe. I mean, it just about knocked me off my feet. It was just unbelievable that such a thing actually happens and that we could actually detect it. I, I, I thought that was a great achievement of mankind. So if you're, if you see it down the road or just know somebody or I don't know, use their phone lines to plan a potluck, I think that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, we, we've gone out there for a couple of potlucks. We had a, for a while, we had an annual picnic out there. They have a, a monthly uh, pub night or day for the public where they invite everybody in for a Saturday. And they've got one of the best science museums I, I know of in the area, interactive science museums. Um, so we've, we've been out there a couple of times. So that would used to be part of our regular meeting schedule is we would have a, a meeting out there. Um, the, the COVID kind of shut that down. Yeah, um, okay. Of course, it's only been operational for for so long, but right. I think what's even more amazing than the, uh, the the hearing the black holes collide is that they're now somewhat bored of that, and uh, they're they're starting to look like for special kinds of black holes to combine. And they wow. just recently found a a candidate for they were, they were looking for a certain range of size right. black hole, and they just found a, a good candidate for that that was uh, smaller than uh, what they thought that the medium range black holes I think they were talking about. Wow. They've also the, been the, detecting the neutron there. star mergers. Yes, and indeed. Black hole with neutron stars. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're now looking for like rare exotic things like neutron stars and uh, neutron stars getting absorbed by black holes. And then uh, I think there was another one that they were looking for. I can't remember what it was. Um, one thing. The, uh, one thing that's really interesting to think about when you talk about the magnitude of that first merger they had, they estimated that three solar masses of matter was converted to energy in milliseconds in that gravitational wave event. Yeah. 
Yeah. Think of three solar masses converted right. to energy right. in a matter of milliseconds. Right, right. That, that's just, that's when you think about energy. Yeah, that's mind boggling. Yeah. I mean, that's mind boggling. That, that, yeah. And that, so the, our, our little scale models where we try and shrink things down to explain the solar system, the kids by comparison seems right. rather tame. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm now imagining some some folk from LIGO with a, a similar model trying to, to show it to our club and us just looking in dumbfound horror trying to, to wrap our heads around what was going on in the same <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, at first but LIGO is a fantastic place and we, we can't wait to, for them to open back up. Oh, yeah. Um, and we're hoping to, to, uh, there's a possibility of a, a, a convention in town, and we were hoping to, to plan excursions out there. I think that was the, the, the gist of that talk when uh, we were talking earlier. The first detection, though, was in September of 2015, and they made the official announcement on February 11th of 2016. Yeah. And, and they saw that signal within like weeks after they fired the thing up, right? Yep, and the, the uh, they went and they they were rampant through for an entire year, and then uh, they took it offline to do some upgrades. And within like a week of turning on the upgrades, they got an immediate hit. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the well. The, turn. Yeah the the original the original LIGO took data for for a for a while for a couple of years or so, and then they were they were offline for a year or two while they upgraded to what they <laughs> referred to as advanced LIGO. And so, you know, we were, we were around for all that. I remember uh, them coming and, and giving uh, talks to our club saying, yeah, at that, that time saying, okay, you know, all this time we've been running and, and what we have learned is, you know, we, we need to be more sensitive, you know, like we can't detect it at, at what we're at, you know, but then they went offline for a couple of years and upgraded. And yeah, like as soon as they turned it on, whoop, they started, started they were hitting middle, that stuff. They were in the middle of their engineering run to verify everything after the upgrade and before they did an official uh, measuring. And it was in the middle of the engineering run that they detected that first one. And from an engineering uh, standpoint, the facility is a technological marvel. Um, if you go to their site and read about the instrument and how it works, it, it's, it's mind blowing. <laughs> the, uh, the mirrors um, are two and a quarter miles separated from the uh, central laser uh, of the interferometer. And uh, the laser bounces back and forth around a hundred times before it's, uh, the readings occur. And the uh, the detection they're looking for is what I can't remember uh, smaller than the diameter of a hydrogen atom, uh, and yet over such a large scale facility they get such precise measurements. And when you think about you know you you know what the wave surfaces of a mirror are, well they they can't use that it's it's just not fine enough. So the reflection occurs in the central mass of the mirrors. So how that's done is still blows my mind. I, I, I don't understand how they can get such accuracy reflecting off the center of the mass of the mirror. Huh. <laughs> I'll have to read about that. Yes. Well, the mirrors are then, coated on the front, too. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, 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 that's anti-reflection. The, the, yeah. uh, they actually have a... a a small, a scaled down version of the mirrors that they're using in the museum that you can go take a, a good look at. The entire thing, you can't actually go walk the length of the telescope. Uh, well, you can on the surface, but it, it's all underground. Um, but uh, you can't actually look at the, the mirrors or anything like that. Only the, you can have access to the control room, and that's about it. Um, and of course, nobody's in the control room because mm -hmm. the only time they let people in there is when they, they're not doing a, a science run. So they and those tunnels the are under a vacuum at all times, too, when they're making actual runs on it. They're under a vacuum. I think the, the yeah. cool thing is like that there's a, a more advanced version of works, which is actually going to, they, they realize they can just launch it into orbit and they, they can have a much larger area for that. I think it's the LISA. Uh, program. Yeah, it's the LISA, and it's going to be three different satellites, and they're going to be uh, beaming between the three of them. They're going to be at the... Uh, I remember at one of the Lagrange points is where right. they're going to be at. Right. Yeah. 
so that one's going to be crazy in, in terms of what they can see if they if this one's now getting sensitive, and I think they're upgrading it again and again to schedule for the upgrades for this thing and when more uh, interferometers are going to come up online, they'll eventually have, be able to narrow it down and pinpoint the, the location of these events. Yeah, well, they have the Virgo one over in Europe, and there's building one in Japan and one in India that they're eventually going to tie in on this. Now, the Lisa for the space one is for a different frequency in different size and types. The one here on the on land will not measure the frequencies that they want on some of them. So that's why they're putting them up in space in a smaller configuration like that to measure the frequencies up there. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions? I, I think that uh, our guest has given us quite a bit of his time. And uh, we're gonna, if he's not, he doesn't want to talk about LIGO anymore, uh, but we'll, and he doesn't want to answer if he doesn't need to ask it be answering any more questions we'll, we'll give him the opportunity to, to go on and uh we'll have a, a so can finish up our, our business meeting after or our little end of our club our monthly uh to do after that um mm -hmm. before ben has to break out the puppets to remind us that he, he needs to, to have a drink or whatever it is but and, uh, we can just look at the, we can look for the shakes ben you don't need the puppets um, but the uh, uh, all right. Uh, so I'm sorry. Any, any more further questions for our? I do. No. <laughs> we invited the big thing. I know we should. All right. yeah. In the live streaming. Yeah. yeah, we're we're still live streaming this, so the the pet's gonna have to go do some creative editing at the end of this to to save his reputation, I believe. Yeah. Uh, um. <laughs> all right. Any more questions? Comments, concerns, criticisms? Well, no criticism. Oh, it was an absolute. Oh, yeah, thank you. It was awesome. awesome. It was very cool. Yeah. I want to thank you, Bruce, for coming and speaking to our group. And it was very fortunate for me to be able to meet you to enable this. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thanks. It's been an honor, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. Very much. thank you. Thank you. Great awesome. presentation. Yeah. Very awesome. All right, and this concludes our uh, public portion of our event, our program for this evening. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for the the August Baton Rouge Astronomical Society meeting, and uh, we'll we'll.